Hey. <laughs> I'm just messing with my microphone here. <laughs> like, what angle do I want today? <laughs> I can't hear you now. I think I'm going to go low on this thing. Oh, where is Joe? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> test, test, test. Can you hear there me? There we go. Oh, right. yeah. The blue is coming through. <laughs> How you doing? I'm all right. I am all right. Awesome. I have been enjoying uh, a maskless life. It's been kind of glorious. And <laughs> what so you got to do with all that freedom? <laughs> I know, right? And it's going to be interesting to talk about. Uh, so that's good. And oh, boy. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. When do, when do you travel out today? Uh oh, lost you. You should. There we go. Yeah. yeah, almost right after our interview, I'm gonna head over to the wow to the airports. And are you flying out of uh, George Bush? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, right yeah. To That's, New Orleans. They're pretty efficient there. To New Orleans. Yes. Sweet. That's awesome. New Orleans is a fun place. I know. I'm. I was born there. I'm oh really? Okay. <laughs> Excited to they're canceling all of Mardi Gras this year. I know, right? What a mistake. It's gonna be interesting though, because that town was founded by pirates. And <laughs> you know, that that spirit kind of lives on. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> So, so from my my uh, inside line there, you know, people people aren't taking kindly to okay, this is what you're gonna do, yeah. Oh, it's crazy! It's crazy, and I mean, they have such a vibrant service industry there too. I mean, those those people rely on Mardi Gras, you know, the restaurant owners, the people that that pour beer and and, and serve food. I mean. Food's an amazing part of New Orleans culture. And so it's like, okay, well, let's just deprive the entire city. I know. It's going to be interesting. So we will see. Um, I'm just, I'm recording now. Um, okay. My setup, I, I just couldn't get it going live yet because, you know, I'm on the, my little computer. So I'm just going to record and then post. So hey, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm stoked. It's, uh, I've basically I got I don't know if uh, if you were able to see the doc I shared with you it's it's a Google doc and sometimes they're not very friendly unless you have a Google right. account that you're accessing it with but um, I, I put together just like random Texas facts to kind of start things off because uh, I know a lot of people are not from Texas that would probably listen and um, uh, get a basic download of kind of what your experience has been this week and yeah, kind of. and this is interesting. So for for those who do not know, I am. It's like Michelle is doing a, a you know part of the country tour this week from <laughs> you know, Las Vegas to uh, Houston to Narlands. So interesting, um, Las Vegas man, you can't let your mask drop <laughs> and <they're laughs> on you. Uh, here in Houston, you can tell that there's people who really feel comfortable in their masks and they maintain social distancing. But for the most part, you know, people who don't want to wear masks aren't wearing masks. The people who want to wear masks are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. If your masks work, then you would think that it wouldn't matter if I'm wearing one and I want that mask, man, that mask is my security blanket, my binky, <laughs> my nighttime, my midday nappy poo that just keeps me safe for the rest of my life. Groovy. That is awesome, Adam. But then there's Adam, freedom loving Adam there who <laughs> is walking around maskless in the world. <laughs> if my mask works, then I shouldn't really care if you're wearing one in theory, especially if, I mean, if wrong, well, those with the antibodies or those who have been vaccinated also, why are they being told to, to wear masks and to, and to not live life normally? I mean, it's just, it's, there's so much like conflicting information out there about what to do and what not to do. And, 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 and just, I, I guess with all that being said, to be forced to uh, really adhere to the decisions that, 
maybe kind of follow a lack of logic. It's just like, man, maybe we can just make our own decisions about how we want to live our lives and the kind of risks that we want to expose ourselves to just at a personal level and at a business level. Um, you know, and then, you know, like here in North Texas, right, you, you see a lot of business owners and businesses continuing to go forward with uh, with their own personal decision to, to mandate a mask. And that's totally cool. I've seen um, that here. Mm -hmm. I've seen that uh, as I'm in Houston, that uh, people you can come in or with or without a mask, yeah. but workers are wearing masks probably a smart decision it makes everyone that comes in comfortable people who don't wear a mask don't care people who do you well, know feel, feel a little more comfortable that's great today you are donned in the red white and blue that is very very cool and how apropos because the president of the united states has said we are looking at normalcy by the fourth of july that's crazy. That's yeah. so crazy. You know, I, I, I decided to rock the red, white, and blue just because I figured, you know, I'm like, what is Michelle going to do with all that freedom when she's here in Texas? <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's it's interesting to think back in, into history. And, you know, Texas was actually, it got the name Texas from Techos, which is a, a Native American word for friend or ally. And I think Texas is all about being friendly to our our ability to make personal choices. And that's why really as of 2021, I'm, I'm gonna sound like I was hired by the Economic Development Corporation, but Texas has the ninth largest economy by GDP in the entire world. Um, it's incredible, but it's also, it's for a reason. It's because it's a really friendly place to come and do business. And it's a, it's a great place to come and build a family and uh, go figure, you know, an intact family and the ability to, to work hard and pursue goals, it equates to something and, and that's growth in a lot of cases. So um you know to to see other states <clears throat> just kind of live differently and 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 really kind of agree with and or conform to what is coming out of the biden administration it's unfortunate i think that a healthy government especially one with a lot of different ideas and and um and different ideas about how to do certain things there's always going to be a level of conflict but there's also always going to be a process about how to resolve conflict and so i think healthy conflict leads towards a greater outcome. It is a, a better outcome for everybody because it, in, it includes compromise. Well, and, but that would insinuate that we are allowing conflict. We're allowing differing ideas and we just are not. I was right. watching CNN just seconds before our interview. And as they were talking about the government opening up, I was noting an awful lot of a one-sided reporting and it infuriates people be, that are that are paying attention that are looking beyond what we're being spoon-fed because we're we feel like we we're being told what to think and, oh that's that's irritating here's what i heard uh we're hearing truth and the the president was saying that that their administration that's going to tell the truth as opposed to lies well thank you <laughs> that i needed to figure that one out but uh and i i heard the word truth over a half dozen times in just a few moments they're telling us the truth now now we're hearing the truth you're well whose truth are we hearing the CDCs, uh, which is a select group of scientists that uh, think a certain way without allowing, like science does, differing points of view. Uh, we heard uh, someone on CNN in, in just those few seconds come on and say, and you know, as opposed to the past administration, now I'm not saying this to champion Trump, I'm saying this to champion ideas and to not be indoctrinated. They said, well, the 4th of July, you heard the president talk about hot dogs and being outside at barbecues with his family. And you could almost hear the da, 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 in the background. And President Trump talked about going to Mount Rushmore. Now that just says everything you need to know about those men. And like, what does that say? It says you do whatever the heck you want on the 4th of July. Oh That's what I want to know. So uh, there's two things to that that I want to present to you in my long dissertation. Thank you for listening. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Is that on, on one hand, are we really going to be free by the 4th of July if all we're really being 
is led in one direction by the media, by the administration, by uh, people who are living in fear? And number two, are we ever going to be truly free? I mean, not just from the, the virus, but really free if we can't have that conflict that you're talking about? Oh my goodness, <laughs> such big questions, you know? I mean, are we ever going to, well, are we gonna be free by, by July, shoot? You know, without this, uh, without this diversity of, of, of information and dialogue and news sources, um, CNN is, is pushing to deplatform any voices that are dissenting from the opinions that their commentators. There was nothing share. on the other side saying, well, here's something that you might consider. Mm -hmm. And it's not just them, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's those who they are friendly with CNN, MSNBC. We, we know the list. It's incredibly concerning to think that if we have an idea that's a little bit different, we're going to be shot down before we even start flying. You know, what if that idea is the solution? What if that idea has merit? Often it is, especially when it comes to well, innovative ideas and, and the introduction of new products and services and thought are what make really our society fantastic. That's why we've grown the way we've grown. That's why we are the United States of America and everybody wants to be here for a reason. You know, it's because of that. And so if, if all of a sudden we're going to say, no more guys, we're, we're done thinking differently. We're done um, having an actual dialogue, which a dialogue I would say is a conversation between two people with different ideas that, that actually works towards a, an, an outcome, right? Uh, I think this, you think that we're having a dialogue, a discussion that's going to lead to something productive. And so when you have a really, really strong group of, of, of individuals who control that dialogue, who control literally the conversation, but also an already really kind of predetermined outcome of that conversation, we have a huge problem. With, with, with CNN, we've seen repeated attacks and also coordinated attacks from really the, the, the House of Representatives, uh, really kind of going after, I don't wanna say conservative media, but, but that's kind of what it's trended to be lately, uh, attacks on Newsmax, attacks on Fox News, um, attacks on any uh, up and comer that might have something to say. This is a problem because it gets rid of a balance of conversation. It, it makes it makes uh, for an echo chamber of just one side of the story. Mm -hmm. If 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 this were happening and they were saying get rid of CNN, that would also be a problem. Let's be let's be clear on that. Yep, we would. need both sides to to have that debate. That's what our democratic republic is really all about. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not really hearing, I, I mean, another thing that I heard was uh, Poppy say, well, aren't we gonna get, you know, kids vaccinated? They're only vaccinating to 12 years old. What about the, what about the, the, the babies? I mean, I can give a, a, a shot to a one-year-old, what's going on? <laughs> Problem, problem is, first of all, that shows an ignorance. How is it that these people who are opining, not just giving reporting news, but opining on it, how is it that she doesn't know that up until six years old, you don't have that protein for the inhibitor to work? How do you not know that? I mean, I'm not the big buck, uh, you know, news anchor, and I, I'm just Michelle. I know that. You know, it's so up until six years old, they don't even have that. And why aren't we hearing from the my body, my choice people, you know, where the vaccine's concerned? My body, my choice. Oh, no, not. No, it's not anymore, because now that affects me. No, it doesn't affect you. If you're vaccinated, you should be great, right? Well, I, I kind of wonder, though, are those people trying to be heard, but just being silenced? Right. Like, I, I think it was uh, actually on my Michelle live um, and I think it might have been last week. Um, you, you shared something from the Heritage Foundation with a, a feminist lesbian who was talking about really the attacks on, on gender. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that maybe these people are trying to be heard, but they're just being silenced because you have really strong voices like uh, these representatives out of, out of California, uh, SU, pardon my pronunciation there it might be issue or issue uh representative issue and you're in texas you can get away with saying it different <laughs> most of us just sit back and go okay it's a texas thing oh that guy <laughs> <laughs> oh that texas guy um you know but but you have these representatives who are in a lot of cases funded by some of big media so when you look at what they're doing to try and request the tv providers to really cancel certain networks from their channels 
okay, well, these TV providers also own some of these channels. They own, what is it, AT&T owns CNN, um, Comcast owns MSNBC. So, okay, there's a relationship there that might present conflicts of interest. And they're colluding and coordinating to get rid of potentially a, a voice that should be heard. You have a really good point. And this is something that as you're watching, I don't want you to think like I'm thinking because, you know, you like me. <laughs> I mean, don't even be tempted to think like Adam's thinking because he's such a cool guy. You know, <laughs> look into it. Think for yourself. If we look through history, Adam, we see many times that brilliant, smart um, people have been duped into group think. It's, it's a, a byproduct of how, how we're made, but it can be good, used for good and it can be used for our own demise. You know, and we're seeing that, I, I think the media has become nothing more than a bunch of brown shirts, look it up in, in your right. notes. And we, you know, we're at a really dangerous, dangerous time. You did send some kind of cool information on on Texas that I wanted to share. I thought that was pretty cool. Let's let's take it on. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. So I kind of earlier was talking about where the word Texas came from. Like kind of a weird word, right? Let's let's talk about that. Yeah, it, it came from Techos, which is a Native American word meaning friend or ally. I think that's really cool. It was actually the the tribes that were in East Texas that came up with that before the the Europeans came over. Uh, guys, here's a fun fact. Everybody's like, wow, you know, everything really is bigger in Texas. So there's a ranch in Texas that is actually bigger than the state of Rhode Island, and it's called the King Ranch. And, and for any of you Ford lovers out there, if you have a Ford truck, you may have noticed something called the King Ranch Edition. And it's got like the cool sa saddle leather in it. It's like the, the gasoline supreme high end uh, F-150 that came out. I think it was, what was that, early 2000s or so. It was a pretty cool vehicle. Um, so yeah, Texas is big. There's also actually a windmill farm that's larger, larger than Manhattan which might seem a little bit weird. Manhattan's pretty big, right? The Big Apple. Yeah, come to Texas, check out some mills. They've got a few of them at that farm. <laughs> um, but, you know, Texas is kind of an interesting place too. Um, the people here are, are, are unique, uh, very diverse backgrounds. And, yes. Uh, yeah, and it's a cool mixture of obviously European settlers and uh, just Native Americans that, that established uh, communities and families here early on. And you know, the, the, the phrase, the Six Flags of Texas, right? There's a theme park called Six Flags, and that came from Texas specifically because of, well, it was it was basically the business owner trying to, to kind of give a shout out to Texas history, which, by the way, all kids going through the education system here in Texas are given a nice strong dose of Texas history. And so we, we, we actually have Texas history courses that we take before high school. And, you know, Spain was the first actual country. Texas used to be Spain. That was the first flag that flew here um, after, the, after the Native Americans uh, controlled the territory. But of course, things changed. The French came in and then uh, shortly thereafter, the Spanish were like, no, actually, we, we do kind of want Texas back. So the Spanish took uh, Texas back from the French before the, uh, the Mexican independence uh, took place back in what was it, uh, like the early 1800s or so? And so Texas was Mexico for a while uh, before the, the Texas Revolution, which you might you know hear stories of the Alamo and yeah. good old Davy Crockett and Come you on, may yeah. go to Hill and I will go to Texas. <laughs> you know, so you'll hear really cool stories. And, and actually, if you if you look back at uh, probably Turner Classic movies, probably some some cool movies too about about the Texas Revolution. So that was so we have Spain, we have France, we have Mexico, the Republic of Texas, Texas being its own country for a while. Texas then became the 28th state uh, in the United States of America, but just for a few years because history had to happen, right? Texas actually ended up joining the Confederate States of America for a hot second, about four years or so uh, before rejoining the United States. So the six flags of Texas are real, and it's because we've basically been our own country, but also been a part of five others. Uh, throughout history and in being your own country you're coming under <laughs> a lot of uh, the media's ire and a lot of people's concern even here in texas there are some people who are concerned about how uh, texas is out of step 
with much of what the rest of the country is doing. Uh, Oklahoma is kind of following suit. Um, Maryland, if, I, if I'm correct, Adam, has lifted restrictions with a lot of caveats. Uh, you know, still everyone has to have a mask, mask mandates and such. So uh, Texas, uh, yeah, you're kind of doing your own thing. In a lot of ways, Texas has. I mean, if you look at, you know, the power grid of the country, right, there's an, a power grid for the east, there's a power grid for the west. And then Texas has its own power grid, which actually came under a lot of scrutiny after we had the, the big winter freeze here. Yeah, yeah. And Texas is actually, uh, so in respect of kind of that, that power situation, um, there was this issue between renewable energy and baseload power needs. And so Texas is actually one of the leaders when it comes to renew, renewable energy gener generation in the country. A lot of wind farms, a lot of solar. Um, obviously, we don't have a we have a pretty good coastline, but, you know, hydroelectricity isn't like the end all be all here. Uh, but that being said, uh, our, our, our grid, I think, really is working to sort of modernize what it needs for baseload power. And so when when you hear some of the news come out about Texas being kind of a uh, maybe a little bit antiquated from a, an infrastructure perspective. It's just not true. Uh, for the most part, we do have work to do when it comes to maybe adding some some other clean sources of power to firm up the grid. Uh, I know nuclear is a really good option uh, for, for baseload power. When the wind's not blowing, when the sun's not shining, you got to have something. So, um, but you mentioned, I mean, Texas does kind of beat to the to the I guess the tune of its own drum, right? Michelle, there's a town here called Dish, and the oh. town of Dish actually used to be called the town of Clark. It's a small place with 201 residents. The reason why they changed their name is because these 201 residents wanted free TV for 10 years. So they made this weird deal with the Dish Network company and Dish Network gave them little DVR devices and said, all right, guys, if you change your name to the town of Dish, you're going to get free TV service from us for a decade. Can you believe that? That's funny. And what's in the name? You also have a, a town here called Cut and Shoot. Like, That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and also some throwbacks to Europe, right? We got Paris, Texas. I mean, there's Dublin. Uh, we have Italy. I mean, there's all sorts of like funny little things here. Um, but that kind of shows that there is a, a real diversity that I, I think a lot of the uh, rest of the country doesn't understand that in that diversity, uh, you make it work you, you know, people are people everywhere. They really are. It's, it's kind of the same thing. True story. If you saw my TikTok, uh, I was stuck on I-69 for over an hour in one place. I've been behind accidents before, but never an accident where I'm just sitting there where no one's directing traffic to get around. You just sitting there in traffic and everyone's just on their phones hanging out. And I don't know if things are just a little slower, people are just chill here, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, like you said, people are people. It doesn't matter what town you're in or where you're sitting in traffic. You're going to find someone who's picking their nose and probably another one who's singing really loudly. <laughs> you know, it's just people one guy, Adam, who was like, yeah, I'm not doing this. And so he turned out of traffic, went up the side of the road and then got off at the at the exit and and left. And I'm going, I'm stuck. I'm wedged in the guy in front of me makes a deal with a truck and I could see this, this kind of exchange happening. So you can imagine, I'm thinking, all right, I'm in, I'm doing this. So they pull out, I go, and there are all these people with their windows down because it's kind of warm, warm evening. And they're like, wait, what do you do? I've been waiting here for an hour. They're probably still waiting there now. <laughs> that line was, it was backed up to Mexico. I'm not kidding. This thing was full Texan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people are going, what are you doing? And and I say that to say that I love the way Texans uh, have these differing ideas. I was here before the election. Uh, it was much different than my hometown of Seattle, where people, if you were a Trump supporter or like me, I was a libertarian. You know, there was ire and anger and canceling and intolerance a lot of times. I'm not saying it runs the gamut, but sure. Right? Well, it's, it's very it interesting. Different. Well, it, it's it's interesting, you know, because like you said, there is that that diversity here, and so you know, my brother lives in a part of Dallas where if you had a Trump sign or a support the police sign in your in your front yard, people would throw rocks at your house, you know, which is insane to think about. But then, you know, maybe just a few miles down the road, 
you have the same stuff in your front yard and and it's totally chill you know it's like that's what i found here in texas people were chill about it's fine you know people think differently that's okay uh let's go to church you know or that's okay right. it might have something to do with it i don't know but you know, <laughs> it was really different but i noticed that there were still like that accident there are people who are uh, we're all in danger of just being stuck in traffic going one direction this is what we're supposed to do instead of maybe lightening the load finding an alter a safe alternative and and making things easier we are afraid to think out of the box we're afraid to do what we're not supposed to do that's why i think looking back at the week as we do adam is such an important thing uh, and looking at it from through the lens of freedom um we've been talking a lot about covid so while we're still here let's talk about the 1.9 trillion dollar relief bill everybody gets a little piece of the pie right oh my gosh pay yeah. us off and we'll believe whatever you want you said it bad. Everybody gets a little piece of the pie. I mean, so it's interesting, you know, the Affordable Care Act was titled the Affordable Care Act, but it made health care very unaffordable for a lot of people. This relief bill is titled really the it has the word relief in it. Right. But I think it was the American Rescue Plan. I mean, these these bills are given these misleading titles to let people think that it's all about this when it's really about that. There's so much. OK, nine percent of the relief bill, 9% of that $1.9 trillion is actually relevant to COVID, yeah. which is insane. So like at the end of the day, we have to pay for this, right? Like we, it's coming out of our pockets. It's hurting the wealth of our country. We are just digging a, a really, really, really deep hole that we're going to have to come out of someday, hopefully God willing. But you know, the, the relief bill that was passed with really like zero Republican support, you know, we're a country with ideas. We have to compromise and come together to make deals that work for everybody. This particular deal is like a, it's like a wish list. It's like a, it's like a slush fund that's been created. And I'm concerned about the long-term implications here. We have in this bill, I mean, there was like $350 billion allocated for states and local governments. A lot of them that aren't even in need of this money. Only 12 states actually showed a need for financial support here. So, Where's the other, where's the other money going? What's it, what is it being used for? Um, there was money in here for Planned Parenthood, for civic volunteer agencies that actually had ties to uh, that bailout fund for the rioters. So, you know, in my mind, I'm like, what are we doing here? When you have a, a, a bill that's a stack of, of paper that really nobody's read and it's passed and it's just kind of given the signature because it has a fancy title and it makes for a nice press conference, uh, we, we've got a big problem and this is kind of it's not uncommon we're seeing a lot of, of, of bills being passed this way my concerns about this particular bill are what they're going to do for the welfare state of this country is the money in this bill going to be the start of something that stifles the ability of uh, really some of those minority communities to to actually find opportunities in the private sector that allow them to create generational wealth that allow them to thrive and survive and, and, and pursue happiness. A, a lot of what our country has done from a from an allocation perspective when it comes to allocating government money towards uh, certain social programs, in fact, has created the opposite result uh, being uh, creating a result that doesn't provide opportunity, but in fact, it holds people down. So we have to give people the tools and, and help people make the right choices to, to live their lives in a really happy, healthy and productive way. The, the the stuff the contents of this particular bill just don't do that no but but they're also not even for covid like if no, we're going to do right if we're, if we pop out kids you make money pop out kids you make money yeah, uh yeah you know, if we're gonna pop, if we're gonna allocate funds for schools that's fine let's do that but let's do that separately right so we can actually have a conversation about it yeah yeah instead of sneaking it in um it it, it really is I, I'm sorry, but I don't think we're really seeing what, um, if we want to talk about racist issues, mm -hmm. 
uh, we have it pointed in the wrong direction. We have white saviors uh, for the most part in our government and in the think tank areas that are saying, hey, uh, we're gonna give everyone child credits and we're gonna give everyone a, a minimum wage and, and we're gonna raise it across the country. Who cares if cost of living uh, in, in LA, Seattle and Portland are through the roof and in Alabama, you know, the average person doesn't make $15 an hour. Uh, that's fine. We were just going to give out someone else's money. And, and you know, without a conversation, I, I, I can see a minimum wage is, is fine. But without that conversation or without freedom, we're in such a weird place where we're not even thinking and we're going to throw out, uh, you know, we're going to pay you for, for having kids. We're not going to work on the fact that some of the biggest problems within the black community is fathers aren't present. Uh, there was a, there's been conversation about that, but that's awful. That's racist. How dare you say that? Hey, look, it's true. Fathers aren't present. And the Black Lives Matter movement uh, had to take down from their page. And one of the few things that uh, has we've seen a retreat on the uh, we stand against the new the traditional nuclear family. I saw that that was shocking to me. You know, so I think all right, so Black Lives Matter, I, I think you got to kind of cut that into a couple pieces as an organization, huge problems. As a, as a statement, obviously Black Lives Matter tremendously, without question, but the organization itself is a Marxist organization that does not perpetuate the ideals that are good for uh, the black communities of our country. They, they just are not. You know, we need to do things to support our HBCUs, the communities around those. We, we need to do things to help create economic opportunities that allow for black families and black business leaders and just uh, community leaders to really just kind of create success for themselves and for their family. We can't, we can't entitle or give because that, that really does the opposite, right? When you, when you create entitlement programs, it doesn't matter who, which community those entitlement programs are for, it disincentivizes um, hard work and, and it, it really kind of stops you from really looking beyond the, the walls that you're confined to. But when you, when you, when you open up the, when you open up the door, when you when you shine some light on opportunity that truly exists, then great things can happen. And so it's been really, really sad to see sort of how the Black Lives Matter movement has, I mean, really kind of negatively impacted our country. In one respect, it's opened up a, a, an important conversation to have about uh, ra race relations. But on the Good other point. hand, the organization itself is one that's very dangerous. So, you know, I, I always think it's important to sort of slice the the word black lives matter into a couple pieces to kind of talk about it one as an organization and what that organization stands for but then two you know just race relations in general the, the discussion of diversity and inclusion what that means uh, equity versus equality um, how can we actually make a difference um, versus i think the organization that tries to exploit uh, political and financial resources to gain power yeah. So how can we actually make a difference in the community versus how do we support an organization that might be counter to everything that our country stands for? Yeah, um, I within weeks after the George Floyd incident, I was at George Floyd Square standing right in front of the memorial to to him and his death. I walked around, around the neighborhood and I want to tell you in that neighborhood, it was not a Marxist uh political movement, Adam. Uh, uh, no joke, the leaders there, I sat with them, I talked with them. It, it was a, a, a real interesting feel to that neighborhood. Number one, they wanted to have dialogue with, with the city. Um, many of the leaders weren't interested in, in completely overturning the, you know, uh, defunding the police. They just wanted to have more inclusion mm -hmm. in what was going on in their neighborhood. But yeah. it went deeper than that, and it surprised the heck out of me. And this is not what you saw on the news. I think uh, night, George Floyd's family was a part of that conversation, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, and his and friends, family. Every night, though, Adam, there were baptisms on the street. 
Every night there was, uh, there were meetings and people were preaching the gospel and I'm not here to get all Sunday school on you, but which I will do anyway, but (laughs) it was some, there was something different there. And I think that's indicative of what's happening in the country today. The more crazy and over the top and canceling that we, that we get the more people are going, okay, this is getting weird. And we're looking for something real, not being forced into thinking what someone says is right based on what, but something deeper. And at George Floyd square there, they were looking for something based on the real truth. If you don't have God, then what is your truth? There is no ultimate truth. So your truth is subjective. And then because it's subjective, other people can't come to that conclusion without you forcing them to, right? And so we're seeing what, what's happening here do you think we're going to start to see people going the lights coming on and going okay wait a minute you know what i think we're kind of getting there you know and, and 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 this is a i say that universally i think a majority of our country is starting to kind of see what's going on and so I, I i think in a lot of ways not only do they see what's happening in terms of the organizations that are driving a lot of the diver, the, the, the division in our in our country I think people are actually kind of realizing we have a lot more in common than than what we're kind of hearing here. And and so looking at, at mainstream media and some of the garbage they're spewing, frankly, um, it, it's been it's been kind of interesting to see a really widespread rejection of media bias to start. And the media is, is hugely responsible for a lot of this because they amplify messages. And Michelle, you know from from your career in journalism that being an objective source of of, of the news is hugely important. So when and you look wait, at the- wait, 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 it is. I know that because I've been there. But I'm also. You may have heard me tell this story that in the you know when I was just starting in the nine mid late nineties. Uh, I was so excited about being part of the news, Adam, and, and being objective was a badge of honor. If someone couldn't tell how you leaned on the story, you you have arrived. That was good journalism. But something happened. My uh, editor came to me after writing a news story saying, this is great, well written. But if you say it like this, people will think this. And that grew. That idea is there. No, we're going to say it like this because we want people to think this. It's better for them. No, it really isn't. Uh, and we have no room. Uh, uh, a story that that you had brought up uh, in our emails, we don't have room for um, anything outside of the norm or even for flubs. This was kind of an interesting one. Tucker Carlson. Ooh, Tucker Carlson, you know, so Tucker said some things that were, I think, really stupid. The thing is, it's well, okay. T- to say- let's talk about that because people may not even know some. People- yeah. So in a, in a nutshell, basically earlier this week, um, of course, Tucker has commentary before he introduces a guest, you know, and um, basically Tucker was talking about women in the military and he was kind of making a fool of himself in, in the way that he was being. Uh, disrespectful about women in the military who may become pregnant and certain things that from a health perspective and just from a decency perspective that need to be done in the military to, you know, obviously take care of some of those needs. Um, Now, as a result of some of his words, you know, Tucker is obviously facing a lot of backlash. I saw just a lot of fire on Twitter. Um, There's a lot of fire in general online specific to what Tucker was saying. Now, as a commentator, as a, as a show host, there are going to be things that come out of every show host's mouth that are either controversial or wrong or not necessarily okay to say, right? Look at us, right? (laughs) Um, But the thing is, is now the military is saying, you know what, guys, we're going to cancel Fox news from the military bases. Okay. So here's the thing. The government should not be canceling any, voices that are out there in our in our media if tucker is going to say something that might be stupid because i think that without question we can all agree i hope that we can all agree that women in the military provide a lot of value and they're they're just as worthy as that's as true but th- what's wrong with having that conversation Absolutely. Uh, uh i have you and i probably both have friends that are in the military women who've served in the military uh one of my best friends in the world uh she was an ex-marine but there are those conversations of a fraternization of a, of some distraction those things are things that we should have 
conversations about definitely, in order definitely. to strive for excellence. And no, the military has no place. Oh, no, the government has no place saying, oh, we're going to cancel because there's this little thing that I have heard in front of my show for decades. The views and opinions of this host do not represent the staff management <laughs> right. uh, or maybe anyone in the known universe. You know, it's called right. disclaimer. Well, you know, if, if people are going to have a problem with a host or, or with, with the, the words that are exchanged on one of these shows, let the ratings show that, right? That's fine. Turn the channel, look elsewhere. Um, but by all means, we can't just cancel um, a, a very loud voice that's that's on the on the TV or in the radio. Uh, Senator happens Tammy to be Duckworth. one of the biggest proponents, traditionally, uh, commentary-wise, of the military. Um, and and well, that's a theory. Where- Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so it's very possible also because I know Tucker Carlson is, um, he has an above average IQ, right? He, he's, he, he might say things that a lot of people agree with or strongly disagree with. It's very possible that he was using his platform intentionally to say something incredibly provocative to spark a conversation about women in the military um, and, and gender in, in, in general. So, there are cases where these these hosts knowingly use their platform to knowingly say something that they know is inflammatory to start a conversation. Now, whether and that's okay, that's it's commentary. It's right. meant to be commentary. Uh, we're just in such a crazy cancel area. And here's an example of something that is nine at uh, those who like to cancel, and that's parlor. Oh my gosh, Parler is continually under under attack by by everyone that disagrees with everything they stand for. Which I didn't even honestly, speech. I'm not cool. So I didn't even know what Parler was before a lot of this, you know, we're canceling it. I was, you know, just I maybe heard it tossed around, but it was like, okay, whatever. Uh, but then when I realized uh, that I've been canceled uh, at times on, on Facebook for posting. In fact, last week, one of the news stories that we cited um, on vaccines oh, was yeah. taken down. It was I'm not surprised. Was it the one out of Israel? Yeah, I was of course like, it are was. you kidding me? It was canceled. I mean, people can't go and research it for themselves. I'd never been canceled before. <laughs> I feel like really cool. I think we talked about this. I'm getting t-shirts that people can buy on my Michelle Law. Canceled. Canceled. <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited. I've been We're going to wear those on Fridays, y'all. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Parler basically was this, this kind of Twitter alternative. You know, it was like a very early Twitter with uh, the same concept for the most part in terms of micro blogging and you know sharing different things about what you're doing today or what you're thinking about uh parlor existed because there was a huge trend taking place on twitter and on facebook that was literally like michelle kind of getting to canceling thoughts that really their leadership teams disagreed with so you have in this kind of this is actually something that i want to ask uh, uh professor alan dershowitz this guy is a great thought leader on constitutional law, but at what point do we start to consider <clears throat> certain social media platforms to be utilities? And so mm-hmm. at, at what point do we sort of basically take away some of the power that these leadership teams at Twitter and Facebook have to silence and censor uh, debate and conversations? W- where is the line drawn? Because right now they enjoy Section 230, which really allows them uh, immunity from anything that any of us might say, however terrible that might be. Uh, these these companies do not have, they don't legally have to be subject f- to uh, take responsibility for anything their users post to these platforms. So it's it, my question is is why are they why are they going about the the activity of picking out who they want to shut down and who they want to lift up. You know, it's not, it's, they don't have to do this at all. They don't have it's to. It's indoctrination and we're all falling prey to it, you know, and we're told what to think. And based on our ideology, I don't even think we can, we're, we're to a point where we have to see, and we do this on right, left, wherever. Oftentimes we have to see uh, what our favorite commentator says in order to confirm what we think. We're so afraid to think for ourselves. I see that happening. And I saw that with the Megan Harry uh, interview. <laughs> you know, people were like, I don't know what to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you watch that and you go, why are, why are, why are we watching this? We yeah. Like what trend. is our obsession with the Royals, you know, in the United States? We're, we're, I mean, I just, I'm trying to figure out what our obsession is with the Royals on one, on one side, you know, 
But but on the other, I'm just like, well, yeah, why are we talking about this as a nation? I mean, it, the the United Kingdom and England, like, their their history is very rich, right? Now, it, it's interesting to kind of hear the the substance of this of this interview that took place this week. Uh, obviously, some pretty controversial things were said okay you know. the brown thing that was yeah. probably the one thing that you're going oh if that's the case that's kind of, but who said that no one right you know, it, it is once again not something that we can get a back and forth on it's like yeah there was discussion about how brown you know what I'm going to just be straight with you. You live in Texas. There's a diversity, as we talked about. You know, you can have a, a white guy married to a Mexican chick. And you know what? You're going to have that conversation. Are they going to come out with blue eyes? Probably not. But what if they do? Uh, is it going to look like every family, no matter what color you are, has a conversation? Sure. What is this child going to look like? Is it going to have dark curly hair like me? Is it going to have, you know, whatever? You're going to have that conversation. Yeah. And you know what, Michelle? I want context. I, well, exactly. Oh my gosh, context is the word you just pulled out of my mind. You know, I was listening to what uh, Alan Dershowitz was saying about this particular topic, and he was like, "You know what? If I were to cross-examine Harry and Meghan, I would want to ask them specifically what is the context behind that." You know, mixed race. Oprah, couple. hello. Sure. I mean, well, you know, biracial couples are, I think, just like other couples, and I think that when it comes to having a, a pregnancy that you're talking about, a lot of those conversations are conversations of excitement. You know, and, and so you have parents just kind of wondering what their kids are going to look like and what features they're going to have. And it's not because they're just like, oh, my gosh, what if they look like this? It's, and maybe, oh, my gosh, what if they look like this? Just you don't know. Perfect. And then yeah. it's just it's just this accusation. This who said that? Right? <laughs> that was her <laughs> response. And you're like, what? <laughs> and, and, and of course, you know, the context is important because there could be a negative connotation to it. Yeah. Or, it or it could just be people being super excited about the possibility of just know. having a beautiful child that, you know, looks like mom or looks like dad or looks like a little bit of both. And you're just kind of wondering, you know, what is this beautiful kid going to look like? And you know what? Uh, one of the interesting things is the, the royal family has kind of ruled over a majority of the world at one point, you know, in history. If they were to have a child that maybe is a little bit darker in shade than than um, I think Harry, who's a bit of a ginger, right? He's pretty pale. Um, that would be, a, I think, a fantastic, beautiful addition to their family, right? And and so I think it that you show a lot, you know. And and what if? And I, I'm not leaving out the possibility that they're like, you know, we want everyone to be lily white. But I'm also saying, but what if they're saying, hey, what if this child is a bit darker? That says something nice for us. It really shows that we're, you know, we're a 21st century. Uh, royal family. The context we matters. Don't know context, and people are coming unglued without having any context over, you know, a, a couple of spoiled, you know, roy royals who you know are living in their multi-million-dollar mansion with their servants, and we're supposed to feel sorry for them. Didn't they get like a million-dollar deal it. here? Wasn't this like a million-dollar deal they got from from Netflix? I guess about. Um, yeah. Right. And, and it's not OK. So the United States is about merit. We're a meritocracy. We, we get to where we are through hard work and, and, and through our merit. Um, the, the what is it? Uh, the, the quality of our character. Right. And, and so but but here it's the royal family. You're born into this. You're born into these these royal, these, these millions of dollars and this this vast wealth. You're born into this status and this power. Um, it's really everything that is not current in terms of what really our society and, and also the the British sort of uh, survive and thrive by. We, we, we survive and thrive based on hard work and um, collaboration and, and, and compromise in some cases. We don't survive and thrive for the most part based on where we were born and, and what we were look like when we were born. You know, we just we just don't. No, but we're trying to put ourselves back in those boxes. We're trying to put ourselves uh, in in these uh, boxes that limit freedom, limit our movement, limit our interaction. Tell us that you know some people are just inherently bad. Uh, you know the latest thing now is that your toddler 
uh, you know, is, is racist. Uh, come on. Kids do not know the difference. Kids do not care what a person's color is, especially a toddler. Get over yourselves. It's um, the most ridiculous idea <laughs> ever. Like, it, it's just, it's so ridiculous. And also, too, I mean, when you look at a kid, like, just look at a toddler. Look at a kid that's under three or four. And, like, Honestly, just try to call that kid racist. That kid doesn't even know what that word means. It, it, it's just, it's no, just. No, so nor do they know what transgender and, you know, what, what sex do you feel like is, um, you know, we've right. oversexed our kids and now we're indoctrinating our kids into our own issues. Um, there's just no limit. And I think that the, as we wrap up today, Adam, the, the lesson maybe as we review the week is start to think for yourselves. Look at how crazy things are getting and really start to question that research. Look a little bit deeper because the truth will set you free. You get the final word. The truth will set you free. That's without question. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the day, we're Americans and we have a great system that, that has sort of gotten us to where we are. But it was Benjamin Franklin that basically said it's up to us to hold on to what we have. And so I think we have to hold on to the great system that we've been given and continually improve it, but work with one another to do so. Um, and that's really the bottom line. If, if we can't come together and talk about important issues, then we're not going to get anywhere that's positive. We are going to become victims of history repeating itself. And that's the absolute worst idea when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. you know, Dude, it's like, not, like, oh my goodness. It's not Please. progressive. It's no. not getting us into the future. It's just going back to the same old crap. Well, can you think about, I mean, just think about, you know, World War II and, and just all that kind of stuff. That could happen again, too. You know, so if, if we don't become students of history and if we try to cancel everything that makes us feel uncomfortable and not learn from that, I, I think we just need to look at these things as teachable moments and learn how to not become victims of history repeating itself. Well, as we review the week, we give you the Riz Report, and this is where you can hear the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, not here to tell you what to think, but to help you from being a victim of groupthink. We are taking you to a better place, and I am so grateful for my friend Adam Rizieri for joining us today. We'll catch you next week. Perfect. Thank you so oh, yeah. much. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, yeah. It always is. I mean, um, like uh, like the, our staff um, was saying we were getting together and talking about, you know, some tweaks and some things. And uh, they were like, you know, thing is, it's really cool. I thought this, too. I may have said this to you, is that um, that RIS report, they've all kind of said, um, you know, when you start a new segment with a new person, usually you do it because it's good, but it takes a, a little while before it's like, wow, feels really natural. And there's a really good flow and you hear where each person's going. It's yeah. like, we had it off the bat. That's awesome. I've had, a, I mean, it's been a lot of fun too. You know? Yeah, it is. It's really yeah. cool. But it's just, it's a great, I mean, I think it opens up great conversations that frankly are important ones to have. And that I think that people that disagree with us in an extreme way are probably not going to like us, but people that disagree with us in a slight sort of way are going to listen. And then they're going to realize, Hey, it's okay to have a, a different idea about this and that. Cause we can talk about it. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. But I, I love it. I, I really do. It's a lot of fun. Yes. It's been great. And Hey, thank you for all that information. Um, I, yeah. Oh yes. Yes. There's I so am. Much. You know, that's where I'm deficit. Um, sure. You know, the on air stuff, you know, I could teach a college course on that stuff, but you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. You're exactly right. And, and so actually it, it, I'm writing this blog now about this just because I think it's, it's, it's really important information that a lot of people can get value from. Oh, but, heck yeah. You know um, yeah. You don't know what you don't know. And it's interesting though, because creators really, it's like, okay, I created something great. Now how do I maximize visibility to that? <laughs> And the web is obviously a big place, but there are ways to, to kind of, I don't want to say game the system, but just to kind of like play the variables to your advantage, you know? Yeah. 
And so, and that's what I do as a marketer. And so uh, working to make sure that the content that you create is easy to, first of all, it's easy for the web to digest what it is and understand. I'm sorry, I'm going to eat breakfast as we talk. You're fine. You're totally fine. Um, but, but basically just making the content uh, digestible, not just for the human, but for the robots of Google and Bing and Apple to understand what the content is so that they can really ensure that the right people are, are given visibility to, to the content that's being produced. Um, and, and so there's ways to do that, you know, and it's like, uh, transcribing or having services transcribe every episode and having that text be available on the website that creates visibility for search engines, you know, okay. Apple podcasts, uh, and iTunes accounts for 70% of all podcast listens. It's an interesting statistic because, uh, iOS users are about 30% of the United States. So I think that basically tells us that iOS users are super engaged listeners, um, so, you know, when it comes to trying to get visibility to a podcast, dominating iTunes first is like the priority. Um, and then really it's, it's going to Spotify as number two and then, uh, Google afterwards, but it, there's kind of a, a system about that too. It's like, okay, so if I launch a, po a podcast early on, uh, the, the quicker I gain attention to it within the Apple platform, I can get those guys to feature the podcast and then obviously that feature allows for a lot of incremental visibility mm -hmm. that you wouldn't have had otherwise. It's like being on the Oprah book club, you know, it's just like, a, it's like a total accelerator, mm. uh, like New York times bestseller. Awesome. Um, you know, and so when it comes to obviously getting listeners and sponsors, uh, that's, that's kind of the name of the game there. Um, but, but it's a challenge, right? But there's ways to do it with email marketing to a database of people that are either existing fans or people that you've worked with in the past, um, getting guests on the shows to share uh, every episode that they've been on uh, with their audience, mm -hmm. um, but also too, like actually you have to, it's kind of like sales. You have to ask for the sale, um, you know, asking for the subscribe or asking for the, the review, uh, for iTunes reviews and, uh, time spent listening are the most important things okay. Oh, to, okay. to their algorithm. So, um, you know, obviously the more of that, the merrier, um, now, if, if, you know, it's like these, these platforms are, are obviously pay to play in a lot of cases too. So mm -hmm. uh, with paid advertising, you can literally target your show to people that listen to shows like yours. And because people are trying to binge content that is yeah. obviously within their area of interest, um, oftentimes a like paid advertising through the platforms will get you a lot of new and engaged listeners as well. So, you know, there's a few different ways to sort of slice the, or I guess peel the onion, you know, and it's just kind of a matter of resources. Yeah. Um, some of that, you know, okay. The, the, the strength that we have is that people repost um, their interviews. I, that's interviews are my strength and the people who come on, will be like, that's the best interview I've ever did. I love that. Because <laughs> um, I don't that's ask weird. the same questions that everyone else asks. I, I, it's more of a conversation. I like to pull out the story. So right, that's right. my strength. Um, but I can't rely just on that. Um, I have to run and catch my plane, but yeah, I, yeah, we can I'd carry like it. to talk with you about uh, hiring your company, if you guys are willing, because I of think that you need to, you know, you need to bend to the experts sometimes, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, that's where I really want to grow. And I, we have a great product. And to we me, what, you're once an entrepreneur. I have a product established, uh, which I, I, there are some things that we're tweaking based on, you know, how we're feeling, but sure. product, boom, we've got the product. Now it's about getting it out there. You know what the, the, the entrepreneur journey is about basically doing enough to get by while you have to, and then firing yourself from th certain things that yes. you either shouldn't <laughs> or don't want to do, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's what I, I was so happy the day I fired myself from accounting. Cause I suck at that, <laughs> but, but no, I get it. I get it. And I know you have to go. Well, we'll carry on this conversation next week uh, or whenever you're, whenever you okay. can, but, yeah. but there's, there's, there's so much to learn and so much to, to kind of like focus on. So it's kind of about just identifying a first, tangible measurable goal on paper i want x amount of new listeners or i want x amount of new sponsors or whatever that goal is yeah and then just reverse engineering that goal yeah and i'd like to do that because um i have sponsors that are that want to give me money mm -hmm. i don't want to take their money until i have the listeners to be right. able to justify that it's just not even though these are people who have sponsored me in the past on radio mm -hmm. so um my feeling is though you know i this is why you sponsor me because I'm ethical. So sure. um, 
I have some affiliates, which is great, but I want to see them grow as well. Yep. So yeah, let's, let's talk about that. And maybe even Perfect. send me a, kind of a price list, what we're looking at, what, if, if you can, if you, Absolutely. Whatever, you would, you know, have send that because I like to have an idea and kind of work that in. I also wanted to talk to you. I'm thinking about uh, hiring a publicist. Nice. Um, I think it would be a, a good thing. And I work with a lot of good ones, obviously. Um, sure. But I think that would be really good to get me at my name out there. Um, to comment on, on on things because you know I can do that. So that's actually one of the growth strategies is making sure that you are a guest on other people's shows. Yeah. Um, so that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, oh, introducing host of my Michelle Live, Michelle Mendoza. You know, just like it, it works. Yeah. Hundred so, percent. Yeah. Um, but so, are you thinking about? Um, have you already talked to those in your network, or are you sort of exploring other options? I mean. My guy, Tim, does a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah. And so um, that's, you know, and obviously I work with Tim. So, you know, so I'm kind of looking at the people that I've worked with that I know, um, because I know from a talk show host, who replies quickly, who, you know, gives you all the information, who, you know, I want, that's what I'm looking for. So there's, I have like a top four or five that I, I go to and I love them and I know they work their butts off. So, uh, cause That's I, awesome. so that, no, I mean, Tim is, is definitely a hard worker. If, if you want to talk to him about it, I can, I can just have him holler at you directly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. That'd okay, be great. cool. Yeah. Awesome. What, what did, what did you pay about for a publicist? Cause I've never, of all the times that I've been doing this, I've never asked that question. Yeah. So it ranges literally from like 1200 to uh, 1200 to 10 grand a month. Right. If you're trying more average will be between 1200 to 5,000 or so per month, yeah. but people that are trying to like launch a book or launch a product nationally, that's like 10 G's. Right. Um, but that's like book circuit and yada, yada. We're not doing that. Um, I think you could get something really reasonable for anywhere between like that, that yeah. thousand to a couple thousand a month sort of range. Um, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, when you work with like a, more of a, a PR firm with, with more than just like a person who's really great at being, you know, doing, doing PR, right? Like, um, that's where you're going to be like in that premium pricing range where it's like five grand or so. I think working with an individual, it's just someone who, you know, and trust who's, you know, has a, has 20 or 30 years in a newsroom and has a great network they've built over time, but isn't having to pay overhead costs for office space and for an assistant and for, you know, web teams and yada, yada. Yeah. Um, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's, that's the way to do it. Um, you know, so I would definitely recommend that approach. And wow. frankly, Tim used to work for, um, do you know a name, Jeff Crilly or, or real news? Of course. PR? I love Jeff. Crilly's amazing, right? He's a fun dude. He and, uh, is to me. That's they're the gold standard of information. The way that they they send out their daily, it's like that's what a talk show host wants. That's the information that they sent. Boom. That's what I yeah. want. And oh. I've hired I've hired Crilly uh, several times in the past for for clients also. And uh, but but Crilly has really built a a great business over time. And I got to get the door real quick. Oh no worries, no worries. <laughs> All right, my ride's here, my friend. Okay. You have to pick up later. Perfect. Uh, high five, great show. <laughs> Travel safe. It. Say hello to your wife and uh, hugs, and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Shoot me a message, and we'll connect sometime next week and just kind of hash things out. I would love that. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Travel safe. Bye.